Hi there, I'm Janet Lynn. And I'm Will Zeilinger. We are coming to you from Long Beach, California. We are a married couple who write together and separately. We also write under E.J. Williams for our new series, International Mysteries. We've met so many authors over the years, and with the advent of Zoom, we thought we'd chat with authors that we know and love. Today we have author Jacqueline Diamond. She is a USA best-selling author and is known for her more than 107 romantic comedies, medical romances, Regency romances, and mysteries. A former Associated Press reporter and TV columnist, Jackie has been honored with a Romantic Times Career Achievement Award. Jackie is currently writing The Sisters, Lovers, and Second Chances series. The book, Going Home at Your Age, can be, will be released this summer. It is part of the Better Late collection of romances featuring couples over 50. She lives in Orange County, California, with her husband of 43 years. Welcome, Jackie. Hi, Jackie. Thank you. Thank 107 you. books. That's one book a year for more than a century. That's right. I'm really much, much uh, older or younger. Than you. <laughs> <laughs> Take your pick. What <laughs> you would well, call prolific. Prolific, yes. I know. And people get the idea that if you write a lot of books, that means that you're being careless or um, sloppy. And that's not necessarily the case. It certainly isn't with me. I care a lot about my plotting and my characters and my readers. Some books went quick and some went more slowly. So <laughs> here I am. Well, that's great. So tell us about your current series, Sisters, Lovers, and Second Chances. This is a series that started out just to be a single book about a woman, a doctor, and she's over 50. And an earthquake in her community shakes her up and she realizes she has some embryos that are frozen. And if she's ever going to become a mom by surrogate, uh, she better do it now. But it's going to change everything in her life, including her relationship with the man who is the father of those embryos and who she has a, a strong feeling for. So I started out with that book, which is called Really at Your Age. <laughs> the baby. <laughs> She's sorry, I pulled it up a little better here. Wow. And as I was writing this book, I thought, mm, she has an older sister who's a kind of a character. And as a, what if she has a younger sister who's a rebel? And between them, I thought, well, I've got three books. And now that I'm writing the third book, I thought, mm, I can see where I could get three more books that would follow <laughs> and be a lot of fun. So uh -huh. things grow. So that's what I'm working on. Uh, the third book, which is... Um, Going home at your age is uh, I just wrote the next to last chapter. So it should be finished and out this summer. That's wonderful. Now, you mentioned the Better Late collection of romances about couples over 50. Yes. How'd that come about? Well, I belong to a critique group with um, some very professional authors for many years. Uh, Terry Black is uh, fairly well known, Michelle Nolden. Christy um, Tate and others. And we were discussing, we don't usually work together, we just critique each other's work. But we were talking about that there's a lot of interest in romances and love stories about older characters. And as we were tossing these ideas around, we thought, well, maybe we could write books that are linked, not necessarily um, the same characters, but the same town. Uh, some of the same events in the background. Mm -hmm. And from that, it developed, I won't say easily, working with a bunch of writers, sort of <laughs> like the, what's the cliche, herding cats. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we, a lot of good uh, names, titles, overall titles were taken. Uh, there was, you know, better late than never. And then we were talking, we said, well, what about just better late? Nobody seemed to be using it, so we are. So if you look, there is a Better Late website, and there's also a Better Late Facebook page, so you can see the books by some of the other authors as well. Mm -hmm. So my books fit into this. They have some of the same settings and character 
few minor characters and so forth, but they stand on their own. What do they call that in television, a crossover sort of? Um, yeah, I guess authors do things kind of we make it up as we go and then we <laughs> <laughs> but uh, isn't that what writing is all about is making it up as you go yes it is there's, there's a lot of spontaneity um there's there are terms people may have heard pantser and plotter a pantser writes by the seat of their pants <laughs> <laughs> and a plotter plots things out in advance but in reality we i'm some of each Mm -hmm. I, I kind of organize, I think about what's going to happen and what are the exciting turning points that will change everything. But then as I'm writing, characters do things I didn't expect, and usually they're a lot of fun, and sometimes I have to go back and correct them. But <laughs> usually, <laughs> usually they're better than anything I would have thought of, just mm -hmm. being rational. Now, I'm a, I'm a definite plotter. I can't write without a very tight outline. And he's the opposite. He he's a panster. I've, I've, I've had to learn though. Fortunately, <laughs> we write the same. I have good ideas, but it, it's been real interesting how we both approach the same story in a different way. Do you and, find that too? Yes. And when I write, I write mysteries, and those have to be. I've got a cover here. A series called Safe Harbor Medical, and I'm going to remember to hold this up. So people can see it. Mm -hmm. This is the first of four four mysteries featuring a doctor as the hero. I I thought it would be fun to have a small town doctor as the hero. In this case, he's the modern equivalent. He's an obstetrician, which is often the family doctor, and he gets caught up in cases involving his patients, his family, his friends. He has a he's a widower. His uh, Sister-in-law is a private investigator who moves in with him, not entirely something he wants, but his father-in-law already lives with him, so it's okay. <laughs> and the, the mysteries in these are fairly tightly plotted. So I did have to do a lot of work. And I do have a friend, he's a retired sheriff's investigator who read over all these things, answered my questions, told me when I was straying from credibility, um, so they're the, the Safe Harbor Medical uh, Mystery Series. And this is a spinoff from my Safe Harbor Medical Romance Series, mm -hmm. which uh, was originally, that was originally published by Harlequin. These I'm self-publishing. That's what I was going to, going to ask you next, is that uh, you've been so well known for having been uh, published by Harlequin and, and other big publishers. So why have you decided to self-publish now? It's a good question. Until about a dozen years ago, self-publishing was not a real viable route for authors. It was too difficult, too expensive. Uh, how did you distribute your books so people could find them? And everything changed with digital. Uh, I give a lot of credit to Amazon. They were not the only place that started digitals. Um, there have been other companies that made it uh, inexpensive for authors to create our books, publish them ourselves, and make them available to the public, whether as digital books or in print. This expanded our opportunities. And I reached a certain point where I had finished the Safe Harbor Medical Romance series, loved the characters, loved the setting, and I wanted to write mysteries. And that really doesn't fit with what Har Harlequin does. So I said, well, guys, it's been fun. I'm going <laughs> to take this chance. I've saved up my money and um, reached the age of social security. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you oh, let's admit it, admit it, and I'll take a chance. So that's what I've done. And I wrote four books in that series and had it got very good responses. I won't say I got rich on it. I wish somebody would make a TV series, which I think would make a great one. <laughs> <laughs> somebody listen. <laughs> <laughs> so of all, of all these books that you've written, um, is it hard for people to find stuff that you've written years ago? No, it isn't. Um, besides the fact that a lot of used books are wandering around, and I wish they would because I don't make any money off of them. <laughs> also, I, I revise things. What happens is 
an author with a conventional uh, publisher, we sign a contract and normally there's a clause that says at a certain point and it varies, you can get your rights back. So I have got the rights back to a lot of my older books, which I then revise updating where I can without, sometimes you can update with cell phones and sometimes you can't mm -hmm. and then put new covers, write new blurbs and make them available. So okay. if you go to my website, which is Jacqueline Diamond, dot net or dot com but Jacqueline Diamond is the important part I have most of my books listed there uh, hopefully easy to find uh, you can if you see the front page it'll show what's on sale right now and some things that are actually I have one book that's free right now but I can't guarantee it will always be free um, so you should look at Jacqueline Diamond dot net to find out what's been <laughs> and download it well, at the end, at the end of our recording uh, of your program, we will have your website posted so mm -hmm. people can go oh, there. Good. And good. I don't have to keep repeating it over to hate people. Jack <laughs> yeah, and they can get more Jacqueline Diamond books. <laughs> now, I have to ask you, you are juggling a lot of balls with a lot of novels. How on earth do you keep them straight? Are you ever afraid of using, like, um, plagiarizing. plagiarizing yourself? <laughs> Well, I will admit there are some themes that tend to recur. A very popular one is uh, The Secret Baby. Mm -hmm. And in The Secret Baby, the traditional plot was she got pregnant. He got went off to war in the army. She couldn't find him. She had this baby and was ostracized. And now he comes back to town. Oh, he's got a kid. And she suffered so much. And can she forgive him? And so on. That's the traditional um, Secret Baby plot. I don't want to write that, but I do all kinds of variations. The more fun and twisty, the better. Mm -hmm. uh, in uh, Going Home at Your Age, which is the new book to be released this summer, she had a baby out of wedlock. The, the father was a jerk, but she had a, a male friend that helped her out. And mm -hmm. she kind of fell for him and he was not ready for that. So she gave up the baby for adoption, left town, married somebody else. Now she's back and divorced. It's Christmas. All kinds of fun things are happening. But the baby she gave up is now a grown woman having a baby of her own. And her, her adoptive parents, who were wonderful people, are now deceased. And she would like to meet her birth mother and perhaps have her birth mother there for the baby's delivery. And, of course, the hero, the boy she left behind is an obstetrician you see it <laughs> oh. so the secret baby and none of her family knew that she was pregnant mm -hmm. so there's a lot of twisty turny things that are kind of fun so you, have to, you have to keep coming up with new names for people too i do and i do keep lists and i do have baby name books <laughs> okay good <laughs> I have one from Jennifer to Jason. That's a fun one. New age baby name book. Of course, the internet is great. So if there's a, anything about their family history, if they're Irish, if they're Polish, if they're anything, whatever, you can look them up and find some interesting names. And then I always alphabetize them. I have a list of characters per book and I have them alphabetized so I don't have you know, George and Georgette and, and mm -hmm. Mary and, you know, it's so easy to do that. Now, when you started out, did you know it was going to get this complicated? <laughs> no idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to tell you, I, pre I published two books a year for a while and I did plagiarize the name. I used it twice. And of course, my readers got on me right away. You know, <laughs> and I thought, how could I, yeah, how could I do this? I'm a lot more careful. I use a spreadsheet now, but yeah, it is a very embarrassing when you use the name twice and somebody else has to tell you. So I learned my I, lesson. I'm sure I've done that. Oh, cute. Speaking of names, many years ago, I had a Harlequin coming out and the hero's name was Chad. Well, do you remember the election where oh. <laughs> between Gore and Bush, second younger Bush, and the whole thing hinged on the hanging chads on the back oh. of the board. And uh -huh. what happens? 
But right that month of that election, my hero's name is Chad. Oh, dear. <laughs> and you can roll over, and it's not like with digital. When you're self-publishing, you yeah. can go in there and change it. Well, you can't do that when it's in print. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's carved in stone. <laughs> yeah, you used to write, and you worked for the Associated Press. You also wrote weekly television columns. How did that happen? And how does it help you write your fiction writing, with your fiction writing? Well, I, I always was uh, aiming for a career in writing fiction. Uh, either uh, I started out with plays that didn't earn much money. Uh, I went into novel writing, took a while to get published, and then worked for two newspapers, got hired by the Associated Press in Los Angeles. I had a background in theater uh, for various reasons and began writing with their approval of the occasional theater interview. And there was a time after I, I decided to stay home and have babies and write, one of their TV columnists retired and he was writing two columns and they decided that the reporter they had didn't have time to do both. So they asked if I would do one as a freelancer. So for about a year, I wrote a weekly uh, interview column for the Associated Press. And I got to meet a lot of famous people. Plus I, I enjoyed interviewing like the makeup designer for Star Trek mm -hmm. um, and West, West, Michael Westmore and other interesting people that, that I think about and would like to know more about. So I had a great time and I did one of the last interviews if not the, the last one with Raymond Burr who played mm -hmm. Perry Mason on TV. I'm old enough to remember all these. Oh, so are we. <laughs> yeah, I remember all this stuff. <laughs> so it, it was really a lot of fun. And then times changed. They got a new bureau chief. They decided they didn't want to have a freelancer writing their columns. And so I was uh, off to do something else. But I was, I was writing novels and I was, I taught writing online for a while. And that was interesting. Mm-hmm. But, Did any uh, stories come to you from those experiences? Um, well, I learned a lot from them. I Teaching people, you do really come to understand, I mean, issues that maybe were not issues for me. I had my own problems, but other people have different yeah. problems. And you begin to say, oh, this is how they need to deal with something. So it, it gave me a broader understanding mm -hmm. of the issues that can crop up for writers. Do, do you ever run out of ideas? Hmm. <laughs> That's a good question. It, it's not the idea, it's how it's developed. For instance, as I said with the baby, secret baby, if you just do it straight, you will bore yourself and your readers to death. The tricky part is, number one, you need characters who are interesting and they do things for reasons of their own that you need to be have developed their background to where it is credible, but maybe nobody else would do it that way. Mm -hmm. I, I just reissued a, a book called um, Diagnosis Expecting Boss's Baby, which is the first of a trilogy, uh, Dr. Circle. And it's available on Kindle Unlimited for free for those who subscribe, in which the heroine is the, it was a secretary, but now she's an executive assistant. She's been upgraded in my revised version to the doctor who's the head of the hospital. And they, they indulged, she got pregnant and she's afraid to tell them because she lied on her application and she has a few other sketchy things in her past. And most people wouldn't let that stop them, but she's a little kooky and she's trying to juggle too many balls. And so there's a lot of humor as she gets herself into more and more trouble <laughs> during the course of the book. Uh, but oh, uh, so you, you come up with these twists and they come from character. And you also think, well, what if, what if this, who would do that? What would happen if this other thing happens? So we play variations. Well, good. So what advice do you have for an up and coming author who's just starting out? Good, good question too. Um, one of the trickiest things in begin as a for a beginning writer is finding your voice. Who are you? What makes you distinct from everybody else who's out there? You don't want to sound like everyone else. 
and you need to do a lot of writing to find out who you are and get feedback. Get uh, not just one teacher, although we could start with one teacher if they're helpful to you, uh, and feedback from other writers, but don't stick around if they're running you down. So mm -hmm. kick them to the curb and keep going and find until you find somebody who's not bringing you down and try different things that appeal to you. So don't be in a rush to just, oh, I'm going to write the great American novel, make a million bucks, mm -hmm. uh, throw that up on Amazon and everybody's going to flock to read it. Uh, you're probably going to be very discouraged and some people quit writing entirely. Mm -hmm. And that's unfortunate. Give yourself a break. You have to learn the skills, find out who you are, what you have to say, and learn the, as you get into it and you're writing more, then learn about the profession. You have to respect the profession of writing. It changes. It's very different now from when I started out in the 80s. <laughs> I'm just picking it up. <laughs> um, and you have to... Um, go online, maybe take some courses, uh, get on Facebook. There's groups for writers. Mm -hmm. um, another group that I met you guys originally in uh, a Orange County chapter of uh, Romance Writers mm -hmm. in America. Mm -hmm. That's a great group. The chapter is now disaffiliated from the national organization uh, for complicated reasons. It's called Orange County Romance Writers. And you can find it on Facebook. They have their own page. They meet once a month. You can attend virtually, so you can sign up to just wherever you are. If you're in Timbuktu, you can attend from Timbuktu. And every roughly third meeting, they meet in person in North Orange County, California. So if you're in the area, you can come and meet everybody, or you can be on the big screen and be saying, hi, hi, here I am. And they have really good speakers. Uh, we had uh, Maggie Marr, who is a, um, an attorney who represents uh, intellectual rights. So we learned a great deal about intellectual rights for writers and authors. There's uh, Celeste uh, Holmes. Oh, Celeste Holmes. That was the actress. <laughs> Celeste <laughs> Barkley was one of our speakers about uh, writing. So it, you can learn a lot from groups like that. And you can meet other writers and get feedback from them. I, I agree with that. You, we would not be where we are now if it wasn't for all the organizations that we've been a part of. Now, I have to ask you what I ask all of my authors. Do you eat and drink when you write? No, never. <laughs> <laughs> Water. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the excuse, Janet. <laughs> the only thing that I eat or drink while I'm writing is water. Oh, coffee. I'm sorry. I, I do drink coffee. Do you? And do you listen to music when you write? Never. I, it's too distracting for me. Really? Yeah. I, I've never been able. I like to have silence. I informed my husband and children when my children were young. You do not disturb me when I'm writing. I, you do not ask me questions. If people call me, I'm borderline rude. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working. <laughs> yeah, I people should that, realize that yeah, that's, it's work. It's work. It's not it is. Yeah. It is. And sometimes people used to, you know, they go, oh, I didn't know you worked. I go, yes, <laughs> my books. Yeah, so, Janet likes instrumental music, puts her in the mood. Yeah, I can't I can't write without noise in my head and food in my mm -hmm. mouth. So I eat and drink and you know, water and I eat, drink, water, and listen to music. You know? Well, I think now, each person has it's like finding your voice. You well, find your process. Well, the thing is I have to be totally stimulated to write. Everything, all my senses have to be in work for me to do that. Now he is like you, he has to have total silence. He drinks water. But that's it. And it's, when we write together, it's like we're we're in a room with we don't like each other because we're not <laughs> talking to each other. How can been, you write in the same room? Yeah. Been, I guess we have, a, we have a, an office we built, and sometimes we'll be across the room from each other. And uh, <laughs> I look over. I said, "No, people didn't notice. They really think that we didn't like each other at all. <laughs> yeah. We were just sitting there pounding away. And, you know, we're writing on two different writing two different chapters and that kind of thing." Well, it is ironic because I used to work in a newsroom and it was very noisy, mm -hmm. but I was not writing fiction. And that to me is very different because 
writing fiction means you're working on multiple levels. So you're working on the intellectual level where you're thinking of what's the shape of what you're writing or I do. And you're also working on an emotional level where you're inside the characters, the mm-hmm. viewpoint character and feeling what they feel. If you don't feel it, the reader won't feel it as I'm sure you guys know. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's a multiple process. So for me, I don't want any interference at all. We, we talk with one writer who has kids and writes all by her. She says, I only, only want to be, only come to me when there's, if you see fire or blood, that's it. <laughs> that's it. That's it. That's it. And the kids grew up, you know, there's fire or blood, then they, then they interrupt mom. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. My kids learned and my husband's very good about that. <laughs> Not disturb me. I'm, I'm lucky that I have my own office. We planned that. I, I was, uh, well, it's not old now to get married. I was 28, but at that time it was somewhat old. And I was um, already working at a newspaper. I don't think I published any books yet, but I knew who I was and what was important to me. So it was very clear in our relationship that my writing, even though at that time I had an outside job, that this was work, this was my profession. And there were no, this was not secondary. You know, I was not, you know, first going to go run, cook the meal and then take whatever time I could get to write. It was didn't work that way. Yeah. So if you can establish the guidelines when you're starting, it's much, much easier. I had students that really had a hard time and really could not even write till they were older. Uh, sometimes kids were grown. Sometimes they were divorced or widowed or uh, whatever it took. And uh, they were very frustrated by that. I mean, we have to live with the realistic parameters. You have to have a job. You got to have an income. But the people around you need to respect you. That's true. Jackie, it's been wonderful talking with you. It's been a long time since we've talked. Yes. And I appreciate you being on our show. It's been fun for me. Why is this time has flown by? (laughs) Oh, my goodness. (laughs) Okay, Willie, listen, you take care and good luck with everything you're doing. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Thanks, Jackie. Bye. Thank you for watching. We will see you next time on Chatting with Authors. Be sure to push the subscribe button at the bottom of the screen. Stay safe, everybody.